e-bikes like this need a motor of some sort, otherwise they wouldn't be e-bikes. And by EU law, that motor can supply a continuously rated power of 250 watts to the bike when it's being pedaled, up to an assistance limit of 25 kilometers an hour. Those are the rules. And does that mean that all e-bike motors are basically the same? No, of course not. E-bikes come in a dizzying array of styles and at a huge range of prices. And the motor you find on an eight grand electric mountain bike isn't the same as you'll find in a 600 pound electric folding bike, not at all. Welcome to the slightly confusing world of e-bike motors. In this video, I'll talk you through two basic types of motor and what to look for. Let us know what kind of motor you're running in the comments below. And if you want to see more e-bike content from us, subscribe and hit the bell icon. There are lots of e-bikes out there and there's a broad range of options at all kinds of price points. But for all that, things are pretty simple. E-bikes essentially use one of two types of motor systems. Either the motor will be centrally located and drive the cranks, or it'll be in one of the wheels and drive that. These are generally called mid motors and hub motors. Now there are outliers, but let's generalize for a moment. Cheaper bikes use hub motors and more expensive bikes use mid motors. Why is this? Mostly it's for two reasons. Firstly, mid motors are more complex. Because of that, they're more expensive to produce. Secondly, a mid motor replaces the bottom bracket of the bike and it needs a specific frame design with the correct mounting points, which means there's more development required and it's more complex to make. Many cheaper e-bikes use stock frames, which won't work with a mid motor. Let's deal with hub motors first. Now, there are two different basic types of hub motor and there are two places you can put one. In terms of its design, a hub motor can be direct drive, so the motor drives the wheel without anything in between. The outer shell of the hub is part of the motor, or it can be geared with a set of reduction gears in between the motor and the wheel. There are advantages and disadvantages to both designs. A direct drive hub motor has less moving parts inside and that means less things to make a noise. So pound for pound, they're generally less noisy than geared motors. Less parts also means less parts to break. So they tend to be more durable than geared motors, which usually use nylon gears that will eventually limit their operational life. And if you're making some kind of speed pedelec, for example, then direct drive motors are usually good for faster speeds too. Though below the 25 km an hour European cutoff, that's less of a benefit. Geared hub motors, on the other hand, generally have lower drag when the motor's not being used because you can add a ratchet like you'd have in your freewheel and the wheel can coast without the motor adding any drag. The reduction gearing gives them a lower top speed, but it also means you get more torque for your get away from the traffic lights or for climbing the hills on the commute home. It's easier to make a geared hub motor smaller too, and the fact that the motor is running at a faster speed makes it more efficient, which extends the battery life. For all these reasons, geared motors are now more common, but for all their differences, both types have the same general benefits. They're reasonably cheap to make, and they're easy to fit to a standard frame. Obviously, you've got two wheels on your standard bike, and the motor can be in either. A front hub motor is the simplest of all to fit, and for that reason, you'll generally find that retrofit kits use a front hub. Because it doesn't have to deal with any drive forces uh, from the pedals, a front hub motor can be made more cheaply. The cheaper an e-bike is, the more likely it is to have the motor there. There are downsides to a front hub motor though. Having the weight at the front of the bike affects the handling more, and applying the power to the front wheel can lead to problems like understeer and the front wheel scrabbling for grip on climbs. All other things being equal, the experience of riding a rear drive bike is normally better. Because a motor is only allowed to assist you when you're pedaling, any hub motor will need some kind of sensor to relay that information back to the wheel. If the motor is in the rear wheel, then it's possible for the hub itself to measure torque that's applied through the pedals using sensors attached to the freewheel or sprocket. Some more expensive motor systems use this approach. Mostly though, hub motor systems are at the cheaper end of the market and they use a cadence sensing system. They check to see if your legs are turning. Usually this is as simple as a disc of magnets attached to the cranks, which is read by a sensor. If the cranks are moving, then the motor applies power. With this kind of system, you don't need to actually be doing any work. Just spinning the cranks will have you coasting along under motor power. There are other options too. Some systems use a torque sensor in the bottom bracket or in the chainring itself, and others sense movement at the cassette rather than the cranks. Now, there are a huge number of companies making hub motors. Bafang are the biggest manufacturer of hub motors worldwide, 
and their motors can be found on hundreds of different brands of e-bike. Suntour's HESC system can be found on the very popular Carrera e-bikes from Halfords. And there are a few systems, like the Zehus Hub and the Copenhagen Wheel, for example, that pack the whole e-bike system, including the battery, into a hub motor. That's to name just a very few manufacturers among many. Now, this Isla Bikes Janus Hybrid is using Marla's X35 system, which is very popular in higher-end e-road bikes because of the low overall system weight. It only adds three and a half kilos to the weight of the bike. Now, e-road bikes are one of the outliers here. Hub-geared e-road bikes can be very expensive, not because of the cost of this motor system, but because it's being put into a carbon frame with high-spec components for the lightest possible weight. You can see it's a very neat system uh, with an integrated battery in the down tube and a small rear hub motor. So that's the lowdown on hub motors onto mid motors. And the clue's in the name here. The motor is in the middle of the bike here, sitting at the bottom of the frame. It drives the cranks directly, or more accurately, it drives the chainring directly. The chainring and the cranks sometimes aren't directly connected to one another. Now, mid drives have a couple of fairly big benefits over hub motors. The first is the position of the extra weight on the bike. Motors are heavy, and putting that weight either in the front hub or the rear can unbalance the bike. Front hub motors especially have a significant effect on the bike's handling. With a mid motor, the extra weight is central, and it's as low down in the frame as it can be, so it has very little effect on the bike's balance. And in some circumstances, this extra lump of weight at the bottom of the frame can actually be a benefit as it lowers the bike's overall center of gravity and it makes it more stable. The second major benefit of a mid-drive is the overall efficiency of the system. A hub motor has to spin at whatever the rate of travel of the bike is, so it'll be spinning much faster on the flat, much slower on the hills. Motors are generally more efficient when they're spinning quickly, so you can get a noticeable drop-off in available power with a hub motor as the road steepens up. With a mid-drive, the motor speed is determined not by the speed of the bike, but the cadence of the rider, how fast they're turning the pedals. And because a bike like this has a wide gear range, um, a rider can keep their cadence in the optimal range, whether they're cruising along on the flat or grinding up a steep hill. Inside the motor housing here, there's a system of reduction gears that match your most efficient cadence with the most efficient speed for the motor to be turning. The upshot of all this is that the mid-drive motors are more efficient overall and more efficiency equals more range from the same capacity of battery. There are a couple of other upsides of a mid-motor too. You can use standard wheels at both ends so fixing and puncture is easier and you can have your pick of transmissions. Mid-motors will work with a rear derailleur system like this and also with a hub gear which isn't an option if the rear hub is the motor. Knowing when to apply power in a system like this is straightforward. You just need a sensor in the motor housing to check what's happening at the pedals. Most mid-motors that you'll commonly find use a torque sensor, um, so the motor will measure how much work you're doing and it will add assistance accordingly. Some cheaper mid-motors use a simpler cadence sensor that just checks that the pedals are turning. And are there any downsides? Well, the main one is that mid-motor bikes are generally more expensive as the motors themselves are more complex and the frame design and construction is too. It used to be the case that they were noisier as well, but mid-motors have come a long way in the past few years in that regard, and the quieter ones now are no more noisy than a hub motor. There's quite a few big names in the mid-motor market. Shimano, who are the world's biggest bike component manufacturer, make their own range of motors, and Yamaha and German automotive company Bros also have well-regarded systems. Bafang and Mahler, who we've mentioned before, who are big players in the hub motor world, they both make mid-motors too. There are a good number of smaller manufacturers too, including Fazua, who make a removable motor system that's used in some e-road bikes. This moustache city bike has a motor from Bosch, who have been making mid-motor systems for 10 years and have the biggest slice of the market overall. This performance line motor is one of the best of the current crop. It's powerful and quiet, and it's reasonably light. So that's our rundown of the differences between hub motors and mid motors, and a bit of dive into the tech. As ever, if you have any questions, then ping them below in the comments, and we'll do our best to answer them. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.